Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming out here today. A quick note about the structure of today's event. Um, it's going to be a, a Q&A session. Um, it's going to start uh, as a sort of panel-based Q&A session uh, with our guest speaker. Uh, we've got a wonderful uh, couple of students, uh, Diana Monike and Veronica Goonan, uh, who will be assisting me uh, in asking some of the questions. Um, but we're not going to be here to filibuster the entire time. Uh, we're going to leave plenty of time at the end uh, for the audience to get involved. Um, make sure uh, that uh, you have uh, signed one of the sign-in sheets. It's over uh, on the little, like, little bar over the right there. Um, that way, if one of your professors has offered you extra credit, um, you can make sure that you get that for coming to attend. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, and also, we got plenty of food uh, afterwards, so uh, make sure to help yourselves. Uh, a couple of thank yous uh, before uh, I introduce our speaker. Uh, thanks to the Department of Political Science, uh, especially Hansa Kokar, our uh, new uh, uh, program management specialist, uh, for handling the logistics, as well as the Center for Social Science Scholarship, uh, not just uh, Dr. Filomeno, but also Amy Barnes, uh, who has also been uh, instrumental in um, uh, working out the logistics for this event. Uh, and then also a thank you, um, I don't see her here, but uh, uh, Vice President for Government Affairs, Candace Dotson-Reed, um, facilitated uh, us reaching out. Um, we're doing something new this year. Um, in the past, we've brought in um, academics uh, and, and that sort of thing, but that sort of belied the fact that the title of this uh, holiday is Constitution and Citizenship Day. Um, and so the notion that that should be you know, reserved to you know, law professors who get up and give bowling lectures, um, I think, is, is, um, needs to be uh, revised, especially when um, we, uh, UMBC's core mission is to produce outstanding citizens. Uh, and we are very lucky to have one of them uh, coming back home uh, today. Um, our guest speaker today uh, is uh, the Honorable uh, Mark Chang who's been a member of the House of Delegates representing Glen Burnie since uh, January of 2015. Uh, he's currently vice chair of the Appropriations Committee, uh, and he's also on the Rules and Executive Nominations Committee, amongst many others. Um, earlier in his career, Douglas Chang served as a community liaison for the Anne Arundel County government. He also was a legislative aide uh, to Senator uh, George DeGrange. Uh, most importantly, uh, to understand about Delegate Chang's background is that he's a UMBC grad, class of 1999. Yeah. <laughs> graduated cum laude with a, a major in psychology. He also has an MBA from Loyola University. Considering we don't offer an MBA, it's not an act of treason for him to go get <laughs> that degree somewhere else. Uh, and when he is uh, not serving in public office, uh, he's a, a risk management consultant as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about Delegate Chang's uh, career, uh, the Maryland General Assembly, uh, and sort of more broadly the role that state governments uh, play in uh, the sort of modern political and constitutional sets of issues that we're facing. Um, so please uh, join me in uh, welcoming our special guest, Delegate Mark Chang. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Blake, and thank you to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Thank you to the Center for Social Sciences Scholarship, and thank you to each and every one of you for being here today. I also want to give a special thank you to Ms. Jenny O'Grady here, who is here. We actually known each other many, many years ago and have stayed in touch, and it's great to see all that she is doing with the UMBC Magazine and as far as communication. So let's give her a round of applause. Oh my God. But I thank you so much for being here. As was mentioned, I'm a proud UMBC grad, class of 1999, psychology major, and always treasure the opportunity to be able to come back home. This is home for me, and it was a beautiful walk across campus from my car over to here, and just seeing how the landscape of UMBC has changed so much for the better, from the buildings to the demographics of the students and the caliber of the students, you all are making a wonderful impact right here on campus. It's going to be awesome to see what you're going to do in the future when you leave this campus and graduate and are making a difference in the world. And many of you are already making a difference in the world. And I know the pulse of this community. I know UMBC very, very well because I was a student here. And a lot 
much changed, but also a lot has remained the same. And I want to start off this afternoon with the story of a UMBC student who reflects the biography of many of the students who are currently at UMBC right now. In 1970, a married couple immigrated to the United States from a country about 10,000 miles away from here. And they came over to this country with a couple hundred dollars in their pockets. They didn't have much resources. They lacked linguistical skills, cultural skills, a lot of the mainstream skills to be able to survive and succeed in this country. But they settled in Annapolis, and they end up having three children. And they went through a lot of what immigrant families go through. And this was during the 70s and 80s, when there was even more racism, discrimination, and those types of factors that were involved. Well, the family, they end up growing, and I want to talk about one of the children. It was the oldest child in there. And the oldest child, when that child was 11 years old, the mother passed away suddenly and left the father raising three children on his own. And the father had a small carry-out business, serving chicken wings and sodas and trying to see what he could do to make a living. And this child ended up going into the public school system, and there were times where, especially right now, we're approaching the holidays, the child didn't have a lot of gifts during the holidays, and there were times when the child would go to school and didn't have the appropriate lunch money to be able to buy lunch, and was food insecure, and would come home sometimes to a dark house because the family couldn't pay the bg e bill, or that there wasn't any food in the refrigerator. Fortunately, because of the community, because of friends, because of the great state they were living in, that the student was able to matriculate and graduate from high school and come to UMBC. And that student, though, was lost, completely lost. Didn't know what the student was going to do, and almost didn't make it. But because of the culture of UMBC, because of the grit and greatness culture, because of the past president of UMBC and the faculty and staff and the student body helping to support that student, that student was able to graduate with honors. And then that student ended up getting into public service. In 2014, was elected to the Maryland General Assembly. In 2018, was reelected, and in 22, was reelected. And he serves as the first Asian American to be elected from Anne Arundel County in the Maryland General Assembly. And he now serves as the Vice Chair of the House Appropriations Committee, overseeing a $60 billion operating budget and $10 billion capital budget. And a lot of that goes to UMBC. And that's why it's such a great honor to be here today to share my story. And that's why I'm so thankful to UMBC, the Department of Public political science for inviting me. Because any time I can come back and share my story, which is the story of UMBC retrievers, it's always an opportune time to come back and reinvest in our current students because we as UMBC retrievers have so much to offer. I just want to thank you so much for allowing me to share my story as we open up the conversation, and I look forward to our dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, Diana, I think if you're, we have you hitting lead off. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that moving story. Could you tell us a little bit more about your career and how this led to your current role at the House of President Politics? Sure. After I graduated from UMBC was with, with a psych major, I worked in the nonprofit sector helping individuals with developmental disabilities and then end up working for Anne Arundel County government for several years. Loved that role because it really gave me a sound, solid foundation of local government and how local government works with state governments and the federal government and really helping people on a regular basis. And really it was just year by year and just 
working in opportunities to be able to help develop my public service skills and also build the network and build the relationships and also understand about how I can be effective in serving others through this role of being a public servant. And that's kind of how it evolved, but I would say that you know when I was in high school, I did have this little bit of a passion in me. I did serve in my student government association and then also served as a class officer and I've been able to have a conversation with some of the students here and I definitely feel that there's that bug, there's that seed that was planted and I would say that it, as those seeds and those planets, those seeds continue to flourish within you to not ignore them, that those passions that you have inside of you to utilize those and there are opportunities and you're going to have setbacks. Let's be real here. There's going to be setbacks in life. But I would say to continue to remember who you are and the principles that you have and to be able to work through those because through those obstacles, through those setbacks, it makes you a stronger person and it makes you, I think, a better person to be able to serve others. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now let me uh, jump in with a little follow-up. Um, we're lucky to have Dr. Stokan in the audience with us who teaches an excellent course on state and local politics, but I know that some of you in this audience have not had a chance yet uh, to take that course. So um, Delegate Chang, uh, for those of us who aren't experts on state politics, can you talk a little bit about how the Maryland General Assembly uh, works? Sure. The Maryland General Assembly is, is a 90-day session. It goes from January to April. And typically during that 90 day session, there's about 3,000 bills that are introduced. And those subject matters vary from social justice to fiscal issues to environmental issues, health issues. And then there's different committees in both the House and the Senate. And what happens is, is those bills that get introduced, it goes to those different sub subject matter committees. And then they get a hearing. This is a way for people like yourselves, for students, for the community, for advocates to get involved in the political process and the democratic process and to get engaged and then there's hearings on the bills and then if a bill gets out of committee then it goes to the chamber it started in. So for example, it started in the House of Delegates, the bill, the bill comes out of committee and it goes into the House chamber and then it succeeds out of there. Then it goes over to the Senate and then it goes through the same committee process and then work its way through the Senate chamber. And then after that, it goes to the governor for either a signature or if the governor doesn't sign it, it comes, becomes into law, or the governor could veto it. And then there's the veto procedures that happen where the legislature can override those vetoes or, yeah, that the governor had produced. But there are different ways also where prior to the legislative session that there's ways for the residents of Marylanders and also different advocacy groups to get engaged in the process by reaching out to the members of the legislature, letting them know what are their priorities, what's important to them, and you utilize UMBC, for example, as an example, that you know we always, me personally, and because I love the school, we, I often hear about the needs of the school, how we can do more, whether it be helping the students with different support resources or building needs, and as those preparations are being made prior to the session that we help to formulate those different policies or those different programs or different fiscal packages to help with regards to, for example, UMBC or the other types of issues that we are advocating for. But again, it's, it's, it's a very busy time. January to April is when the legislative session occurs. So about 3,000 bills go in there and it's really a lot of moving parts. And but I think as a legislature, as a state, that we're doing a better job, and a lot better job too, in that it's a, it's a lot of transparency. For example, if there's an important bill that you really are passionate about or care about, you can track that bill. And then there's also notifications to let you know where those bills are going. For example, if it passed out of committee, you'll be notified that it passed out of committee and it's going to the chamber and then in all those different ways. So there's are, so there's are ways to be engaged and also, with the pandemic, you know, obviously we had to move into a virtual world and with Zoom, and now with Zoom and then having that platform, it does make it a little bit easier for people all across Maryland to be more engaged in the process. For example, that you know, typically the hearing is in the afternoon on a weekday, and not, not a lot of people can get off of work sometimes and come down to Annapolis and testify. But because of the platform that we have with Zoom, they're able to provide testimony virtually and also these other modes of communication that we have with technology, 
there's different ways to be able to provide that input. I would just definitely encourage you all to be part of that process because it really is a very fluid and vibrant process. And, and also, UOBC alums and students, they're serving in state government right now. They're serving at all levels of government, but specifically Maryland General Assembly. We have a lot of great students who are career professionals or are interns or we're also members of the legislature. And I do need to say this on behalf of a very prominent UMBC graduate speaker of the House, Adrian Jones. She sends her very best regards to you all. She's very, very proud of you all. And she's a, you know, she loves you all and is a champion in our state for the UMBC community. Thank you. So you talk a lot about how your time at UMBC really shaped your career. What skills or knowledge um, that you acquired at UMBC helped prepare you for a career in public service? And just a little follow-up for that. Did you know that you were interested in a public service career when you were about college age? I would say that having that psychology major background that I did get exposed to a lot of the social sciences. And we do have a wonderful social sciences program here and the psych program here. And all the majors, all the majors are great here. But we have, we really do have a culture of greatness, and I would say that those, the coursework in the classroom was very beneficial, but also the different opportunities we had for field study and being able to be out in the community. And there's a lot more opportunities for engagement outside of campus now than there were before. But the experiences I did have at that time, they did really lay the foundation for a heart for public service, and also the skill set, the skill set to be able to talk to people, to be able to work in teams, to be able to collaborate. But again, what I would say is that the culture here during my undergraduate days really did help shape my thoughts on this, that we can all be great. It doesn't have to be just a select group of people, but that we can all be contributors to society, and we all can, you know, and you didn't, we don't have to wait until we get that degree, but that we could start doing those great things while we're still at school and doing our coursework. And, and those are the types of programs we have. And the extracurricular programs, the extracurricular programs here, I was involved in a number of them that did a lot of different community service projects in Catonsville, Baltimore, and the surrounding areas. And all those different experiences, and those relationships, those relationships really helped I still keep in touch with a lot of those friends that I made during my time here and, and faculty too, and, and that's really what helped shape the foundation that I have. And so all those classes you're taking, sometimes you might be burning that midnight oil, like trying to you know, read a book this size, you know, trying to fit it all up in here, but it really does pay off. And, and even though sometimes, I mean, I know for me, sometimes I only catch a percentage of what I remember, but you know, those, those things that really stick with you, you know, keep it in your head, keep it in your heart, and I think that will really guide you down the road. Many of our students here currently intern at the General Assembly, um, and you mentioned that you started off as a legislative leader as well. Mm -hmm. So, what was that experience like, and how did it impact your influence and decision to run? Sure. When I served as a legislative aide in state government, I was in the state senate at that time, working on the senate side. So I'm on the house side, start off in the senate, usually vice versa to get from the house to the senate, but I went from the senate to the house. Got a little pre preference for the house here. But I would say that during my time there, that it really helped me meet who a lot of the different relationship builders were in the state. And a lot of times you were able to, at those times, be in meetings where you got to really meet some of the key people in those different areas, whether it be health, academics, public safety, and there's different types of disciplines. And also that it really helped build those relationships with other staff members, with legislatures, with agency directors, with agency staff. Because within state government, there's about 24 different agencies. And they're on your executive branch, but the way that we're able to work together is when we get a call from a constituent, say that Wilkins Avenue, there's a pothole on Wilkins Avenue. Well, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have the skill set or the resources to go out and fill that pothole on Wilkins Avenue, but we know to contact the State Highway Administration and who to reach out to be able to help with that. Or, for example, when it comes to higher ed, as a student 
I know that specifically they reached out to our office recently and they have special needs, and, but they really want to get into UMBC. And so we were able to reach out and connect the UMBC team with the student and the family and figure out ways, a plan that the student could get into the program, get to a program here and, and be able to successfully complete the program. So I would say that a lot of what I learned as a staffer was about relationship building because you're not going to remember everything up here, but you, you're going to know who to go to. So like if it's a state highway show, you know who to go to. If it's you know, dealing with the Department of Health or vaccinations or you know, there's a public safety issue, those different agency staff members and those partners are really important to develop. And I would say that's a key here is that in addition to all the coursework that you're learning, is to build those authentic relationships and solid relationships that will last for years. You mentioned earlier, introduced Ms. Jenny O'Grady, and years ago we knew known each other, a whole different world, but we've kept those relationships going, and that's really been beneficial. And I tell you, I mean, now with her leadership role at UMBC, she keeps me posted on what's going on over here and how we can help. So yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to, to ask you a question as, as a political science professor, sure. because uh, to political science, you know, this is a relatively rare occurrence, um, but in 2012, you switched political parties. I did. Yep. Um, and so I'm, I wanted to ask sort of what considerations went into that decision, mm. and how were you received uh, by, the, you know, uh, by the Democratic Party, the party you're currently a member sure, of? Sure, sure. In the state of Maryland, you can register to vote at 17. And when I was 17 years old, we had the whole contract with America, and Google it if you don't know it, but the Republicans really were reaching out to the voters. And they really did a really, in my estimation, really successful job in reaching out to the new voters. I was 17 years old. And all I knew is I wanted to register vote, and I wanted to get involved in politics. And the first person to approach me was the Republican Party. And they said, you know what, Mark? We got a voter registration form, just fill it out and sign it. I was like, okay. I didn't, you know, I didn't know any other way. And I will say this on the serious side though, and this talks about how really we need to be more engaging, both sides of the aisle, both parties, more engaging with our new immigrants, with the new voters that are out there. Because my experience was there was only one party that reached out to me. So I was like, okay, well, they must be the only ones who care about me. And as a Asian American whose parents came over here and they're just trying to put food on the table, they're just trying to, you know, they put the, keep the lights on. They're not worried about politics. They're not worried about, you know, Democrat, Republican, or you know, what what the House of Delegates is. They're just trying to provide their basic necessities. And I didn't have that knowledge back then when I first registered to vote and also and it still exists and I say it in a very loving way it still exists but in the Asian American community in the 80s and 90s there were three things you could be in life you could be a doctor you could be a lawyer or you could be a failure and guess what I'm not a doctor and I'm not a lawyer <laughs> but I say that because and I still, it still exists right now. Asian Americans did not have role models who were in public service at the time, during that, when I was growing up. And so I had no idea, so I'm just kind of make, building it as I go. I'm like, I'm, all I knew is I wanted to get involved in politics, I wanted to serve, and, and so I ended up getting in, you know, signing up for my voter registration initially as a Republican. And then, as we all go through, we all mature, we all, you know, develop our thought process, and I found out that you know, the Democratic Party is more of a, in my estimation, we still have a lot of work to do, though. We still have a lot of work to do. That was more of a big tech, it's more inclusive, it's more about equality and inclusion. And I think that that's how I was able to, you know, my thought process and how I evolved as, as far as political parties go. But I will say this, though, that no matter where you are in the spectrum, in the political spectrum, get involved, but as the major parties out there, both sides, all sides, we need to do a better job of reaching out to our new voters out there. Yes. All right. Veronica? 
So I want to switch gears and talk a little bit more about the work that you specifically do. Mm -hmm. What would you say your biggest legislative achievement to date has been? Thank you very much for the question. Since my time in the Maryland General Assembly, I've served nine years on the House Appropriations Committee, and we deal with the budget. We deal with $60 billion in operating, $10 billion in capital. Capital is your brick and mortar. We're right here. This library right here, AOK -OK Library, new public policy building, the beautiful arena that we all have at UMBC, all of that, thank you to the state of Maryland, was able to support those types of brick and mortar structures. That's operating, that's capital. Operating is to be able to help with the, 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 the classes that you have here and also you know, keeping the lights on and you know, keep the staffing and the salaries and all that. So that's all operating. And I enjoyed it every day. I enjoyed it because I get to see firsthand how the dollars we allocate from the budget committee is really helping Marylanders. We've got a lot more work to do. And, you know, during the pandemic, we, at the start of the pandemic, we were facing in the state about a billion dollar deficit, but because of different federal stimulus packages to the CARE, the Corridor Relief Act package, to the American Rescue Plan, to other types of stimulus packages, we were able to help recover. But now, as we see it right now with inflation, with the cost of things going up and you know, supply chain issues that we continue to, are going through right now, different fiscal cliffs, whether they be with transportation or other types of budgetary issues. But I would say that on a daily basis, I love being able to see how the dollars that we have from the state of Maryland are helping the people of Maryland. And that's really what I would say is I'm really passionate about. And in addition to that, Coming from a fiscal mindset or fiscal committee, I was able to help shape legislation also in the policy arena and social justice. Prior to the pandemic, there was unfortunately a rash of, and it still exists, but there was a rash of hate symbols that were being spread all across our state, whether it be Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Howard County, Anne Arundel. And there were hate symbols being put up. And in my home county, in Anne Arundel, the judge, there was a court case that was being litigated where the state's attorney was trying to prosecute someone for putting up a hate symbol on a school property. But a judge ended up ruling that there was a loophole within state government that there was an any law to be able to punish the person for doing that. In 2019, I had sponsored a bill, in 2020 I sponsored a bill again, to strengthen our penalties against hate crimes. Specifically that if an individual places a hate symbol on a public property, that it is punishable by law with imprisonment and also with fines. And the message that we sent through that bill was, and that legislation that passed was that there is no place for hate in the state of Maryland in any community. And that's probably one of my proudest legislation outside of fiscal issues that I was able to contribute to be part of. Because I know what it's like to go through hate. When I was 10 years old, I remember coming out on a hot summer day out of my house. My parents were, all, my family were all about to get in the car. And this may be a little graphic, but I need to be honest and, and vulnerable here, if I may. That you know, I came out of the house, my parents, my parents came out of the house, my, my, kid, my siblings, and we're about to get in the car, and then we see hanging from our fence post a deceased cat hanging from a noose. And we didn't know what to do. I mean, do you call the police? Do you call, who do you call? We, don't, we didn't know. But I still remember that traumatic incident that happened. And I wanted to make sure that no other kid experienced the same thing I did. 
So that's, I would say, is probably one of the most personal pieces of legislation that I put in. So thank you very much, Dr. Burke. Thank you. Well, you've already touched on uh, budget policy. That was one of the things that was on my list. So let's, let's keep it going. Diana, how about you jump in with the, the next question? Oh, sure. Um, you're a member of the Maryland Legislative Asian American and Pacific Islander Caucus. How diverse is the current General Assembly, and what impact does diversity play into the General Assembly's priorities? Sure. Within the Maryland General Assembly, there's 188 members in the Maryland General Assembly, and as I mentioned earlier, Speaker of the House, Adrian Jones, graduate of UBC, she's the first African-American woman to be the presiding officer of the Maryland House Delegates, so they all will be proud in that. And so that's right, Lindsay. <laughs> she's a definitely a reflection of the diversity that's ever increasing in the Maryland General Assembly. And Within the Asian American Pacific Honor Caucus, we have eight members who are of Asian American Pacific Honor descent, and that spans from Howard County, Montgomery County, Anne Arundel, and Baltimore County, and that's at 188, and it's we're, it's at a start. It's at a start. We're at a start right now, and and but I think what's really encouraging to see is that you know, prior to Governor Moore. Governor Hogan was the governor of the state of Maryland, and his wife was a Korean American. First lady of, of Maryland was an Asian American, and she really did a wonderful job in being an ambassador for the Asian American community. And, and I think that, from my perspective, I think that really helped open the floodgates for more Asian Americans to be inspired or to get involved in state government and, and local government, because I, I at that time, during that window, I saw more Asian Americans getting into government and public and, and serving as public servants, whether it be working as a staffer in the Maryland Department of Health or being the special secretary of business and minority affairs or deputy secretary of the Maryland Department of Health or you know, these other types of different agency positions. And I think that we are as a General Assembly are being more reflective of, of the constituents we represent, but I also think that state government is being more reflective of the people that we serve. And just looking in this room right here, wow, I mean, you all are the future. And, you know, talk about myself 25 years ago, you know, talking about 25 year old self, you know, back then, I would just try to pay it forward right now, and <clears throat> just if anything, I'll, you know, want to be encouragement to you all because you all will be the next generation of leaders in state government, in in international government, or in international relationships, or, or local government. And so, you all are the future. So embrace it. And I'm really encouraged at this room that I see today on a, look on a beautiful Friday afternoon, on the first lecture of the series of the year. This is a great turnout. So thank you all for being here. Uh, well, uh, I know the, uh, the students up here have uh, a question, uh, a, a couple of questions left on, on what they want to cover, but then we're going to turn it over to the audience. So please start be th uh, thinking uh, of uh, anything that you want to ask uh, to our special guests. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Veronica? So I'm going to turn it over to the Constitution. Yes, um, yes please. So yeah. it is Constitution <laughs> Day. Um, so as you know, we live in very turbulent times mm. going political conflicts and constitutional crises. So what role do you envision Maryland and some other states playing to check the federal government when it takes actions that Marylanders would oppose? Sure, thank you very much for the question. And yes, we are celebrating Constitution and Citizenship Day. And I would really encourage all of us that if you haven't had a chance before, visit Independence Hall. It's where the Constitution is birthed is located, and if you go into the Independence Hall, you'll see the room there where George Washington, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, they all got together as a convention, and they helped work out the Constitution. And it really does signify about just really our democracy. And when you go in there, you'll really experience how 
you know, this whole social experiment of democracy we're in, it's ever evolving. It's going to change. It's, policies are going to change. People are going to change. As I mentioned, you all are going to be making the decisions one day. And so it's really important to remember where the birthplace of our democracy occurred and that it wasn't easy. When they got together, Independence Hall was actually the Pennsylvania State House at the time, in 1787, there were various iterations going on. And there was amendments after amendments, rewrites and drafts, and it's hard work. So it, it wasn't you know, a bunch of people getting together and being able to solve all at one time, but it was a process. And that's what I would say is that public policy is, is a process. It changes with the culture and where our society is leading us. And if you go into Independence Hall and you go into the room where the, where the convention met, that George Washington was presiding over it. And Ben Franklin, he looked, got up and sat in that chair where George Washington sat, and there's a sun on the back of that chair. And Ben Franklin was thinking, is the sun setting or is the sun rising? In his, in his estimation, and I agree with it, I believe the sun's rising. I believe that today's a new day, tomorrow's a new day, and that there's a lot of hope. And that the sun is rising where we're going to become better people and a better democracy. But that depends on all of us continuing to challenge ourselves, and challenge the way that our Constitution is, whether it be U.S. Constitution and the Maryland Constitution. To address the specific question, because we are so close to Washington, D.C., we do actually are very symbiotic. There's a lot of, there's a strong connection in that what happens 20 miles down the road, really we're sensitive in the state of Maryland. And actually in the state of Maryland, we have more federal assets in our state than any other state in union. That shows that we're really reliant on the federal government, which can be good because during recessionary times or during times where there's economic turmoil, that we aren't really as sensitive as the rest of the country because we're so heavily reliant on the federal government. But also, too, that because we have that strong connection to the federal government from a fiscal standpoint, we're able to benefit a lot in getting federal dollars to help out in this area. But also, Shifting gears now over to the policy side, use for example Dobbs versus Jackson, Roe versus Wade. When that happened, the state of Maryland, Maryland General Assembly, was very sensitive to it, and with regards to reproductive rights. So during this past legislative session, the both chambers, the Senate and the House, passed and enshrined where the reproductive rights would be in, into the U.S. into the Maryland Constitution and enshrined in the Constitution. The governor did sign that. So on November 8th, 2024, when you all go to vote, it's going to be giving the voters the opportunity to permanently have the reproductive rights enshrined as one of the articles within the Maryland Constitution. So that's how, really how, what we see in Washington, D.C. on the federal level affects what happens on the state level. And now other states, they're going in different directions. And that's a whole different type of conversation. But as far as the state goes, what we've been looking at is with regards to reproductive rights as an example of how the Maryland Constitution is, is in the process of being altered or revised because of what happened on the federal level. We actually transitioned into our next question. Um, so how do you view the current state of democracy within Maryland versus the rest of the country? And how can Maryland act as a leader in strengthening the rights to vote and ensuring greater protections for politically marginalized groups? Yes. I'm going to be, as a proud Marylander and as a proud member of the Maryland General Assembly, I think we've done a lot of good to strengthen our Voting Rights Act and also to engage more of the voters and protect those when they go to vote to make sure that their votes are secure and that our democratic process is secure and the integrity of the process is, is strong. I'll say this, that from a cultural standpoint, the culture of political culture specifically, 
that we are pretty good Democrats, Republicans. We get along pretty well. 90% of the issues, we're lockstep. We, we, we work very well together. And when we don't agree, we're still civil about it. And what you see 20 miles down the road is not what's happening in the state of Maryland, which is good because we have Democrats and Republicans working together, and they really, both sides, I believe, from what I've seen, the jurisdiction there from, from Western Maryland, from Baltimore City, from Southern Maryland, from Eastern Shore, they really do come with true intentions and authentic tr intentions of being able to make Maryland a great place for all 24 jurisdictions, all communities, all neighborhoods. So I will say that, and we have a really good relationship with our new governor now, and even in, when we had with the previous governor, I would say that the, the legislature, yes, we disagree, and that's part of being family. You know, is that we're gonna have disagreements, but we work together and we work those disagreements out and we try to do the best we can for the citizens of Maryland. And I would say that with regards to voting rights, and this we talked a little bit about this earlier, is that you know Maryland has really try to make the process as more accessible as we can for voters. For example, then now where there's voters who have different types of disabilities, we've been sensitive as a state and are making more accommodations to help voters who have special needs or who have disabilities to be able to get the access to be able to vote. Early voting, eight days early voting. You know, it's open, the polls are open from the morning to the evening, and those are times where you know, we all don't work that nine to five job. We all come from different backgrounds. There's there's families out there who work three jobs just to put food on the table, and they're trying to fit that time to vote in. And we've expanded early voting out those days, and also we had the mail-in vote. And then also with regards to voter registration, how we can get those voter registration process where people can actually register to vote and make sure that their votes are when they do the mail-in ballot, ballots, that those votes are cast, and they can check to make sure that the Board of Election has received those ballots. And also, again, if any, if you know any 17-year-olds out there, if, they, if they're 17, they turn 18 by the next election cycle, they can register to vote. But I will say this, though, that even though we're making the voting process more easier or try to make it easier that there's still the percentage of people that actually go out there and vote. It's sad. I gotta, I gotta hang my head a little low on that one. I mean, we gotta get out, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but we really gotta do a better job to get out there and vote. I mean, you know, even with like the, the elections that occur, I mean, only a, a percentage of the electorate goes out there and votes. And really, we gotta do better on that. And, and we're trying to, but those are the different measures where we're trying to make voting more accessible, but also protect the integrity of our voting process. I can't think of a, a better way to uh, describe Maryland politics and indeed state politics uh, many other places than your opponents can still be your friends. They don't need to be your enemies. That's, right. that's, that's really, really great.